Hello, good evening. Welcome to the October 2022 session of Galactic Terrors, the online reading series that scours the known universe for scary stories, strange tales, weird horror, dark humor, and all sorts of literary oddities from the most imaginative authors writing in a variety of fascinating genres. I am uh, host James Chambers, and with me is host Carol Geisander. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us in the wonderful month of October. It is, as uh, we've seen a few people comment in the chat, the spooky season. Mm. And we're excited to have some fantastic authors joining us tonight to share their work. We have Bram Stoker Award-winning author Michael Arnzen joining us. Uh, we have Michelle Brittany of the HP Lovecast bringing a completely new element to Galactic Terrors this month. Yeah. We're going to be delving into the world of horror nonfiction with Michelle, which should be fun. And of course... Everybody's favorite uh, dapper devil, and I hope I hope he doesn't kill me for saying that. But <laughs> Stephen Van Patten, also known as SVP. Yeah, excellent, excellent. No, it, it's going to be fun uh, listening to all these folks and chatting with them. And uh, as as usual, as we go on through the show, if you guys uh, have any comments or questions for them, please feel free to put it into the chat, and we can uh, share the questions with the readers after they've done their reading. So that'll be fun. Yes. And, so, uh, you know, yeah. feel free to put them on the spot. Ooh, okay. Yeah, yeah. What is the average airspeed velocity? No, don't do that. Don't do that. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Jim, we've been doing a countdown for about six months now. Yes. We're getting 18 there. days left to Halloween. 18 days to Halloween, folks. Yes. Ooh, so, enjoy your costumes. You can. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Jim Jim has a creature behind him. I, I, I think it's going to take a chunk out of his neck at some point. So uh, he may transform right before our very eyes. I'm not sure. We'll see. I don't know. That's uh, I was I was telling Carol and the uh, the crew tonight a little bit about that guy before we started. He's, he's an ancient Halloween decoration that I had for many years that uh, had about a six foot wingspan and, and red eyes that lit up and just looked fantastic uh, during the October and eventually weather got the best of the poor fellow. Oh, oh, that's sad. That's sad. So you mummified him. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. But Carol, you, you had dug up some interesting ideas for, um, for some, some jack-o'-lantern techniques. Yes. You, you know, about. lots of people like to carve their own pumpkins and, and you can do that, but it does take a little bit of time and the, you know, it's a little bit messy. Well, there's another way to go about it. You can, it's an automatic self-carving pumpkin. There's really like four major steps. Jim, can you show us uh, the, the first step here? Sure. Step number one, okay. acquire well, a pumpkin. Yes. You need a pumpkin <laughs> and you need a drill. And you drill some holes in it so you can probably tell that's going to be eyes, nose, and a mouth. So first you drill the holes, then step two, mm. fill the holes with peanut butter. Hmm, this is going to be interesting. Okay, well, you're done with your inside part. That's all you had to do. You didn't have to make a mess of your table. Now you take it outside. Step three, yeah, and some little critters are going to come and help you with this. So this is the squirrels having at the peanut butter and the pumpkin and they're getting started. I mean, that one looks pretty sad and woebegone. It's like, Ooh. but the, the next one's even better. So here's the final image. How is that? Is that a fantastic <laughs> pumpkin? <laughs> so that's a pretty good jack-o'-lantern to me. <laughs> that's great. So drill yeah. peanut butter, pumpkin, and let the squirrels do the work. 
Yeah, yeah, All yeah, right. yeah. So that that should work, and you don't have to mess up your table. So that's a good thing. That's always yeah. nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Mm. All right. So I think um, we had uh, a couple of things to announce this month, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go. That's it. Don't don't try to stop me. I'm going all in on a shameless plug because I think <laughs> October is the is the perfect month to be reading. Ooh, ghost stories, stories. Uh, <laughs> edited by a couple of people you know whose names might be slightly familiar if you're watching this yeah uh, and it includes some wonderful ghost stories by some fantastically talented authors and next week a group of us will be doing uh, a reading from it or readings from the book at the ample hills rooftop readings in gowanus brooklyn so if you are in the New York area and you're interested in hearing some ghost story readings just in time for Halloween, eating some ice cream and other frosty treats, uh, come down to, to Gowanus. Yeah, we'll put the link in the chat uh, at the end about how you can get tickets. You know, it's a $10 admission. You, you should order your ticket ahead. But you get a wonderful dish of ice cream with that. And ice look at that cream. ice cream. Ice cream. Just what we need uh, right oh. before all the candy and Halloween, right? Oh. And <laughs> yeah. I was trying to, they, they, oh, they yeah. go appeared and disappeared. The, our, our readers for the evening will include Stephen Van Patten, Mark Abbott, Amy Grech, Teal, James Glenn, and Randy Dawn. Yes. And the, the cool thing, this is this is Randy's reading series. It's always on the third Tuesday of the month. It's called mm -hmm. Rooftop Readings. So that's where we find it. So, yeah, so that should be a lot, a lot of, of fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So that's neat. And uh, oh, just another Halloween related thing. I was watching Jimmy Kimmel the other day and Jamie Lee Curtis was on. She He had her sign a contract on the spot, on a scroll, saying that she would never appear in another Halloween movie again. This was the last one, the one that's coming out. So I, I thought that was pretty fun. She said, oh, I'll have to check my with my lawyer before I sign. Oh, what the hell? <laughs> and she said, <laughs> thing. It was pretty funny. That's funny because I think I saw a headline just the other day that she was open to doing more Halloween movies. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll see what, to happens. see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fun. And there's one other cool thing going on for Halloween. If you're wanting more Halloween material and info, um, uh, Halloween Haunts is a daily blog series in the month of October on horror.org, which is the HWA website. And uh, all sorts of cool things about Halloween or writing horror or your experiences, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's worth doing. And I I have one that I hope will be coming out in there uh, later in the month. So that'll be fun. Excellent. Yeah, that's always a fantastic uh, event for Halloween, for October. There's a lot of great posts, a lot of great insights, oh, a lot of, lot of horror authors sharing their favorite Halloween stories and memories and uh, insights into the horror genre. Yeah. So organized by Kevin Wetmore, who does a fantastic job with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, terrific, yeah. terrific. Well, speaking of fantastic job, we have three fantastic um, authors with us tonight. Do you think we should ask, uh, ask them to read a little bit for us? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Uh, we're going to start off tonight with Michael Arnzen. Michael holds four Bram Stoker Awards and an International Horror Guild Award for his disturbing and often funny fiction, poetry, and literary experiments. His books include Grave Markings, Proverbs for Monsters, 100 Jolts, and Liquor, L-I-C-K-E-R. He has been teaching horror as a professor of English in the MFA program in writing popular fiction at Seton Hill University since 1999 and currently has courses available to study on the HWA's Horror University. Uh, yes, you can always see what he's up to now at his website, goreletts.com, where you can sign up for his unique newsletter, The Gore Letter. And I will add that Mike is also one of the co-chairs for StokerCon 2023 taking place in Pittsburgh uh, next June. So I, I see how I cleverly worked an extra plug in there. <laughs> <laughs> well done. You get Thank a gold you. star. All right. Well, join us in uh, welcoming Michael Arnzen. Hello there, people. Uh, thanks for coming <laughs> to this episode of Galactic Terrors. It's an honor to be here. 
I appreciate uh, the invitation. I've watched several episodes and have enjoyed them all. But this one already is the best because you have taught us all how to make a flesh-eating bacteria pumpkin. Uh, I think that's awesome, and I plan to do that myself using a variety of bugs in the near future. Um, <laughs> my plan for reading is just to take about 10 minutes or even less to just shotgun you with a bunch of short, short poetry and flash fiction, a uh, number of random things. I always like to start something recent that I wrote to share with people just because, uh, I don't know, I sometimes it, it helps me to think about it before I send it off for publication to do it this way. This, But uh, this one is just a simple, a uh, little list poem called what is your favorite color and uh here they are dead chameleon skin mood ring black sunspot fear red crayola factory accident the color of cornea <laughs> well, all right, maybe that was just corny, but uh, obviously it's more than one favorite color too, but a little strange. Those are the kind of things I tend to write. A number of them are collected in the book, The Gorlitz Omnibus, and uh, this one that I brought to read from you today, 100 Jolts, Shockingly Short Stories. This came out uh, quite a while ago from uh, Raw Dog Screaming Press, uh, and it's the 100 short, short stories, some of them a paragraph long, others two pages or so. I'm just going to read to you one selection from this. It's about a two-page story. It's very short. Um, and it's called Her Daily Bread. From her employer's po porch, the nanny cocked a pear-shaped ear to the sky. Do you hear that sound, my little one? Our birds are calling for their food. She leaned forward and strapped the child into her stroller. The child's arms were a little chill. Do you think you'll need a jacket? The child made a face like a frown before tossing an arm forward to point its pudgy bare arm at the nanny's face and giggle in response. The nanny returned a knowing grin and then grabbed her old denim bag, swinging the strap over her shoulders and clutching it like a purse. A bird whistled from afar. She left the child's jacket behind her. No time. We must hurry to feed them now. Together, they went to the park. On the way, they passed a bakery, which smelled of fresh bread and pastries. It was busier than usual. Preparations were in order for Thanksgiving. The order, order of yeast in the air was as pungent as old beer. The child's pacifier spilled out of her mouth and onto the ground, and she began to sniffle and cry as the nanny rolled the stroller into the center of the city park where an odd statue of a bald man on a throne sat thinking. The man in the statue reminded her of her husband, who had died in the war while the nanny was pregnant. He was always thinking, always worrying, always concrete and still. The child bellowed. The nanny slipped a tiny square of hard, dried bread into the child's tiny mouth to silence her. The child sucked on the brick in her mouth and bit, her gums scabby and bleeding. The nanny found a bench for them. She could still smell bread, and that was one reason why the birds came in, in the world was their home. Uh, this was their kitchen, and dinner was finally served. Turtle doves, charcoal, gr charcoal gray and sharp beaked, always swarmed together in one big flock like a tightly knit family clustering around the concrete table ready to eat. One day the nanny had seen all of them resting on the statue, covering its entire body like a large coat of feathers or a living down blanket of tiny eyes, warming the soul of the body inside the concrete case. Her husband, she imagined, would be comfortable nestling inside such a coat. The nanny poked another square brick of bread into the child's mouth and then another. She dreamed about the child she had lost shortly after the letter came and the children that she now fed, the ones who always flew away but always came back. She was their nanny too, bringing square worms of hard bread to them daily. These birds, her children, would often skittle around the cobblestone walkways that surrounded the statue, chasing strangers with their beaks, pecking stones and pebbles 
which they mistakenly assumed were food. But when Nanny came, they would cuddle and coo, patiently awaiting homemade croutons from the bag that rested atop her breast. They knew she would feed them well, as always. The child tried to unclasp the belts that held her in the stroller like an automobile seat. Nanny ignored her, slipping more bread into her mouth, forcing it, and the child cried out, but the sound was muffled by the gooey chunks of hard dough, which clogged her mouth like clay mud and gravel. The birds were moving toward her now, pecking their way across the stones. The tapping of their talons, the nanny thought, made the sound of water dripping into a basin, like rain or tiny bullets. The flock encircled the child's stroller, waiting, Together, they shared coups of approval. The nanny just grinned. Her family was welcoming her home. She tossed a handful of breadcrumbs over beside the statue's booted feet. The birds swarmed, taking flight, each trying to be the first to get the best bite. Some pecked each other. Such squabbles were common in a close family. And she knew how hungry they could be so late in autumn. One time, the nanny had tossed an entire plastic bag full of breadcrumbs onto the cobblestone, and that had caused quite a stir. One bird, so badly wounded by the others, it had, it had even lost its wing. Now, the nanny tossed another handful of stuffing beside a nearby bench. And again, the birds swarmed in a mad fury of feathers. They were hungry today. She was late. The child's eyes were wide as oil puddles. Her muscles were as tightly locked as the statues. She was bright pink. She frowned as she tried to press the bread out of her mouth with her tongue, but she was too busy choking on the mass, too busy trying to pull in air through her small flaring nostrils. And the nanny continued to stuff her, thinking about another Thanksgiving without her husband, without a child of her own, alone with the yeasty smell of bread. The child managed to break out of the straps around her chest, slipping down out of the stroller, cheeks puffed out like a billows. The nanny did not notice. She was still staring at the statue, her eyes dead and black, her hands mechanically plucking squares of bread out of her bag and just dropping them onto the sunken denim seat of the stroller. The child ran for the statue, searched madly for air, and then the birds swarmed in a flurry, covering her up in their gray autumn coat. Well, that was fun to read. Uh, how about a couple more poems, and then I'll close shop here. <laughs> um, follow me at Mike Arnzen on Twitter if you like to read poetry, because I put these little short gorbits, I call them, uh, up on Twitter all the time. Uh, maybe you've seen some. I don't know. But here are some short, short poems just to wrap things up. I'll read maybe three or four. <laughs> okay. This one is untitled. If a cat has nine lives, it also becomes nine ghosts. All their ghastly mules in the night coalescing with smoky fangs, serpentining around your calves in a hungry ululation as one. And here's an example of a poem that's on the silly side. <laughs> uh, it's called Water and Blankets. <laughs> Water and blankets are two things you'd think could put out any fire. Yet here you heave in the heat, trapped within one of the world's sole remaining waterbed factories as it burns down. <laughs> um, And it looks like I'm almost out of time. So I'll just, I'll just read one more, very short one. It's a haiku, actually. <laughs> it's called Baby Van Helsing. Fang tips chattering in the garlic jar. He rattles at the moon. All right. I think that's all I'll read for today. Thanks, folks, for lending me your twisted ear. Oh, that was so much fun. And, oh. and we had... Slightly different things, you know. So that no, that's cool. That's cool. I all right. You, you nailed me with uh, uh whatever it was the Crayola factory accident. It's like okay, <laughs> okay. I think everybody's mind might go slightly different on that one, but that's very cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. How how do you come up with all these lovely little images that are just like perfect little snapshots of things? How does your brain work like that? 
Well, if I knew the secret, I'd probably have to make more of them. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just start, and I'm so hyper aware of what I'm writing and how it could be absurd that I just write that out. I write. I, I, I let myself be as silly or as dark as as I am, uh, and then I go back and just kind of like meticulously try to like look for hidden lines, you know, some, or I might just tweak the language. If it's a poem, I might make it rhyme or something. If there's a really good line in there, uh, sometimes it's worth it to go back to, through the piece and make things kind of echo with it. It's because it, mm. it's like the ringing of a bell. It really drives it home. I don't know. I, I'm all over the place in my answer, but. Uh, no, 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 that's perfect. That, that sounds, I mean, that's how we write. We're all over the place when we do it. So that, that's yeah. very cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and coffee too, of course. Lots well, of yes, yes. It's, <laughs> it's an amazing substance, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. Well, um, Brian Matthews asked a, quest a question that I was actually uh, wondering of myself, course. which is more difficult or satisfying discussing the writing of others or your own writing? Uh, <laughs> Apply coffee before answering. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a great question because, uh, you know, it presumes that any of it's difficult at all or satisfying. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the answer, uh, of course, for me, I, I bet most people feel this way. It's, it's very difficult to talk about your own work because uh, it's just it's it's hard to make think of it objectively. Um, you know, I was just I was talking to a class the other day because, as you mentioned, I teach English and um, we actually were talking about how writing takes the subjective abstract idea ideations that we have and turns them into concrete when we you know the ink on the page makes your thoughts objective it moves it from subjective to objective and then once it's on the page you can kind of see it with a critical distance an editorial eye and you know readjust things so um you know the writing really happens in revision for me and, and that's you know uh, something to to uh, really think about, but it's mm -hmm. hard to talk about because so much of it is subjective ultimately. And with horror too, everybody thinks that like like you're a twisted person for you know you gave birth to this this monstrosity. You know, there's some dark seed in your brain that created this. You must be wrong or bent or something must be off with you. And uh, <laughs> well, that may or may not be true. Uh, well, you know, hey. Yeah. I think that's why it's hard for me to talk about my own writing too, though, is because I, I sometimes get very defensive about it. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? Or just about, like, I could write whatever I want. And, you know, there's no yeah. process to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I had a, a, an interesting experience. I was at a mystery convention and yeah. uh, sitting at a big table, a bunch of mystery writers. And I said, I, I write a little bit of mystery and a lot more horror. And they're like, oh, you write horror. It's like, wait a minute, guys, all of your stories start with a dead body. I mean, I may have a dead body in mind. I may come back to life, die, come back to life, die. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The zombie who solves his own murder. That's a brilliant yeah. idea. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm going to write that down. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, tell me about your prompts and such. So that. That's speaking of which uh, ideas that that um, come out of, of somewhere. So you, you've got this book of prompts, right? Correct. Instigation. Uh, yeah. Uh, creative prompts on the dark side. So they're all like prompts for horror writers. And uh, I mean, uh, I teach, so I'm constantly concocting these like weird exercises and prompts for my students. Mm -hmm. And I don't always get to teach horror writing though. So uh, they don't all come from that, but that's, that's kind of part of why it came easy, how it comes easy for me to, to come up with these prompts. I'm always curious how people will respond to them. But I initially started doing it as a joke kind of, uh, it was a column I was I was writing in a, a newsletter called Hell Notes that was out in the late 90s to you know, maybe 2010 or something like that. It still is produced, I believe, but it, it, it has a totally different uh, editorial staff and whatnot. But anyway, uh, that column consists of three to five writing prompts that were told like, you know, deadpan normal, but some of the most absurd and insane ideas, you know, I could come up with. So it's almost like a joke of the very genre or on the very genre of the writing prompt. That's how it started. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, and do you, do you like writing from prompts yourself? Uh, I mean, everything's a prompt, isn't it? But um, I mean, you look around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I thought I was crazy, but good. 
<laughs> no, wait, we're both crazy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's that whole stimulus and response thing, right? Yeah. So the prompt is a, you're consciously choosing that stimulus and saying, I'm going to open this prompt book and pick one out. Um, and if you're in a classroom, a teacher might offer a prompt and you got to write on the spot. That could be hard. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't really use a lot of prompts. I, I just know what my ideas are. And as I'm writing, mm -hmm. they just oh, they, cool. they develop. Um, cool. Yeah. And we, but, we have another question from Nicholas Dyack, who is dying to ask this. Uh, which yeah. of the exploring dark short fiction primers was your favorite to contribute to? The most fun to research, dive into, and then talk about? He's apparently, a, he's apparently a fan. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yes. Dark Moon Books puts out a series called Exploring Dark Short Fiction, which focuses on a different famous or deserves to be famous horror author. Uh, by primarily focusing on their short fiction. So it, it's kind of unique and it's, it's, uh, it's an academic study. Uh, there are five, five stories that that writer contributes. I write a response to each of those stories, like, uh, uh, like literary analysis. And then I contribute a longer essay about that writer's work in general or what lessons about the genre can you get or learn from their studying their fiction. Anyway, uh, that's what that book is. Which one was my favorite? Well, let's see, who have we done so far? Ramsey Campbell, Karen Warren, Nisi Shaw, Jeffrey Ford, Steve Rasnick Tam. I bet I'm forgetting somebody, damn it. <laughs> there's, a, um, there's a bunch of them on my dining room table. I would run look, but I'm not <laughs> home right now, yes. <laughs> uh, I think my favorite one was actually the Jeffrey Ford collection. <clears throat> I heard of his name a lot, but I hadn't really read his work, in, uh, except for maybe one short story I once saw in one of the year's best fantasy and horror books that Ellen Datlow edits. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, it was just so eye-opening that to spend so more time reading his stories and going over them, over uh, and seeing new things to appreciate every time I reread them. And so uh, to me, that was like, I learned a lot writing that one. Yeah. Uh, and it was very hard to write critical essays about some about writing that's so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and we understand that critical doesn't mean you're criticizing it. It means yes. Yes. Of course. Right. That's true. Okay. Here's, here's a quickie. Do you listen to music while you write or is silence golden? <laughs> Oh, Amy. <laughs> I, I'm sorry I can't see the chat room. So if you guys are yeah. posting anything for me. But uh, yes, I, I like to listen to <clears throat> instrumental music. If it has lyrics, <clears throat> I either want to listen to them or I start singing along. <laughs> I start typing them, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm so, I'm so um, influenced, easily influenced by music. I've been sitting at a stoplight before my car and... The, the, a song break will happen on my CD player. The next song will kick in and I start driving. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so like, uh, I've only done that once, but I realized, oh my God, what's what's wrong with me? <laughs> so, Honestly, officer, it was another song. I thought it was, yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Okay. And then um, I, I, I love these little pieces that you showed us and, and the poems and all, but here's an excellent question from Teal before we wrap up. Who are the poets that inspire you? Oh, man. Well, I mean, everybody I read, like anybody who's publishing now is really good. Uh, and it's like horror poetry has exploded over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, the, the, the answer should be, you know, read the, final, the, the books that are listed on the final ballot of the Bram Stoker Award under the poetry category. Just get all those. They're all going to be good in, in their own way. They're usually very different, too, because everybody has a different voice. Why am I answering your question this way? Because I can't really name names. They're all good. I, I love everything I read. I get something out of it. Um, I don't like to hierarchically kind of make a best to worst list or anything like that. Uh, and I, you know, in a way, we writers too always think that writing can be improved. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, all writing is bad, is what I'm saying. All writing is <laughs> no, bad. Yeah. yeah. Cool. But uh, there is a poet named John Gray from Australia. He was writing a lot in the small press in the 90s, and uh, I used to just slavishly read his work and, and try to like pick it apart in my brain and figure out how did he pull off this twist ending, or uh, you know, what's look at how, how he's shaping the language in such an intricate way. But it doesn't sound like poetry; it sounds like some somebody just speaking. So he has the plain speech poetry. I really admire that, and 
I try to write that myself. I don't want to be too literary or whatever. Um, uh, that's cool. That's cool. No, that's neat. Well, I, 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 I love all your work that I've read and I, I have enjoyed all the classes that I've taken from you over the, the past couple of years. So anybody who sees Michael Arnson uh, offering a class, sign up for it. Yeah, <laughs> I highly recommend it. And also thank you to you. Uh, people, uh, we're doing a, a drawing for anybody who's on subscribed to our mailing list. Uh, by like Sunday, you know, if you're on the list, we'll, we'll pull some names. And Michael has kindly offered uh, to send out uh, signed copies of two books, both um, Grave Markings and Play Dead. So those are for folks in the U.S. And if you're not in the U.S., you'll wind up with an e-book from somebody as well. So thank you very much for that. And thank you for sharing your words and, and your, your thoughts. We'll see you a little bit at the end. Is that cool? Sure. I'll hang around. Thanks. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you so everybody. much. Yeah. Well, what I'd like to do now is introduce our next author, Michelle Brittany. She's a writer, editor, podcaster, photographer, and independent scholar. Her interests include spy cinema, horror studies, and mummy representation in popular culture. Her first edited book was James Bond and Popular Culture, provided, uh, followed by the Bram Stoker Award-nominated Horror in Space, Critical Essays on a Film Subgenre. She and her partner, Nicholas Dyack, co-edited horror literature from Gothic to postmodern critical essays. Michelle and Nicholas also co-host the HP Lovecast podcast. She resides in Phoenix, Arizona with Nicholas and their kitties, Algernon and Cecily. Everybody join me in welcoming Michelle Brittany. Hello, thank you very much for having me on Galactic Terrors and for being the first nonfiction author on this wonderful series. Um, tonight, I am going to be reading an excerpt from an essay titled Beauty in the Grotesque, Bernie Wrightson's Lifelong Obsession with Frankenstein's Monster. Working at Warren Publishing, Bernie Wrightson began adapting the stories of horror greats such as H.P. Lovecraft and Edgar Allan Poe. He once again wondered if Frankenstein could be adapted to the sequential art form. According to Wrightson during an interview with comic book writer Steve Niles, quote, I still felt the urge to tell the story visually, and like I said, I just couldn't find a way into it as a comic book adaptation. So much would be lost, I thought, in the transition that a graphic novel version would ultimately diminish the novel itself. And by this time, I'd reread the novel so many times and fallen so in love with it, I finally decided to simply illustrate the novel itself." End quote. By deciding to complete a series of illustrations, Wrightson felt he could stay true to the, to the mood, the heart and soul of the Gothic story. There were many considerations to illustrating Shelley's novel. First and foremost was the approach. In talking with Niles, Wrightson expressed, quote, this is my first real attempt to completely serve the story and the author's intentions, and I found it challenging as hell. I really tried to see the story as Mary Shelley wrote it, trying to stay in her time, in her headspace, if you will, and not tart it all up or force my own gloss onto it and at the same time, try to stay true to my own style and my own sense of drama and picture making." End quote. By the time he commenced work on the illustrations, Ryson had already experimented successfully with the mood and emotion of Shelley's novel when he created and illustrated his story, The Muck Monster. The seven page comic provided a reference point, reference point for the direction Wrightson would take with his illustrations. Conveying a precise tone and setting, the emotional pacing was critical. If the visuals did not capture the important narrative beats, the audience's experience with the text and illustrations would falter. Known for his elaborate pen and ink techniques, Wrightson knew black and white illustrations in the style of the early 19th century engravings in wood and printed, would be the method he would have to emulate to be visually in sync with Shelley's text. 
In fact, he wanted to, quote, create the illusion that the book and the illustrations were done at the same time. Always I try to be as specific and as detailed and as faithful to the text as possible, end quote. There was an additional element Wrightson brought to the sketching table. His passion for the literary source, fueled by an obsession to convey the emotional journey of Shelby's creature for a contemporary audience. When Wrightson started his project, he did not have a venue for publishing his illustrations. In a 2008 interview with comic historian Peter Sanderson, Wrightson commented commented on his lifelong interest in the monster. Quote, I've always had a thing for Frankenstein, and it was a labor of love. It was not an assignment. It was not a job. I would do the drawings between paying gigs when I had enough to be caught up with bills and groceries and whatnot. I would take three days here, a week there, to work on the Frankenstein volume. It took about seven years, end quote. Seven years seemed a rather long time to be committed to a project. However, Wrightson's illustrations visually conveyed why so much time passed between the start of the project to finishing the last illustration. Wrightson's passion for Frankenstein exuded from each sketch along with his obsession with perfection. Niles asked Wrightson if he ever wanted to give up. Quote, I can't remember ever just wanting to give up. But each time I finished a drawing, I remember feeling a bit let down, like I just missed the mark even a little bit. If I'd only worked a little harder, I could nail it exactly. Several times I'd start a new version of an already finished piece, or even an incomplete one, trying and trying again and again to just get it right. I drove myself a little crazy through the whole process, but finally I decided that the really important thing was to get it done and quit sweating the small stuff. I mean, I thought if I could get 90% or even 80 of what I wanted, I'd be okay. Otherwise, I'd probably still be working on it." End quote. Spoken like a true perfectionist. Looking at the illustrations, it is difficult to imagine any of the illustrations are less than 100%. Even, oh, excuse me, after seven years and 50 illustrations later, Ryson completed his project. While Wrightson started the journey without an idea of what would become of his artwork, by the end, his volume found a home at Marvel, who had published adaptations of classic literature through their imprint, Marvel Classic Comics. Billed as a Marvel illustrated novel, 43 of the 50 illustrations are contained in the 194-page, 8.5 by 11 book with a wraparound cover of the pivotal confrontation between Frankenstein and the monster. It is illustration 32, and it is one of only three illustrations to span across two pages. The cover has an incredible amount of detail, all the test tubes, glass beakers, coils, and the books that line the shelves and lay on the table where Wrightson has left a half-decayed corpse, the discarded body intended to become the monster's companion. However, the viewer, viewer's eyes are directed to the monster with flowing black hair and a determined grimace as he pulls his creator close, almost into an embrace, as he tells Frankenstein he will be with him on his wedding night. The precise detailing of the scenes showcases Wrightson's stunning artistic style that he became known for throughout his 40 plus year career. Of the cover illustration, artist Walter Simonson was quoted in a Los Angeles Times article, quote, in some ways the lab scene is the core of the story. It's where Frankenstein breaks the laws of God. I think people were drawn to it because it's so completely over the top and yet it's so completely controlled at the same time." End quote. Simonson explain, explained Wrightson's ability to masterfully use light and dark through, quote, incredibly complex pictures, and yet you always see exactly what you are supposed to see, end quote. Indeed, looking through each illustration, the reader is struck by Wrightson's success of emulating 19th century 
wood engraving illustrations through the concise control of his pen and ink brush strokes. Through the use of hatching, cross hatching, and cross contour lines, Wrightson skillfully brought Shelley's story to life. By spacing the lines in a precise pattern, he evoked the illusion of value through light, white space, or more concisely, the direction from which light came across the image, and the dark, denoting depth of shadows as well as shading. The combination of these techniques in a master artist's hands resulted in gorgeous drapery effects, a sense of motion, awe-inspiring sweeping landscapes and Gothic interiors indicative of Wrightson's illustrations. His composition of characters were, new, were unique as well. He would push focal point characters into the background so the eyes were guided from the edge of the image to where Wrightson wanted the viewer's eyes to focus upon. Interestingly, the only close-up is a portrait of the monster, illustration 45. Situated on the opposite page of the closing paragraphs of the novel, the portrait is a study of a solemn, melancholy creature who feels remorse at the death of his creator and realizes he is utterly alone. The monster's visual journey invited the reader to empathize with the emotional plight of the, cre of the creature. Taken all together, the illustrations were a modern approach to classical techniques employed during and before Shelley's seminal novel. In his interview with Niles, Wrightson's reflected on what he felt after completing his seven-year journey. Quote, I finally gotten there, like I had passed a milestone or something, and now I could get on with the rest of my life. I look at those drawings now with a sense of pride and satisfaction and appreciate how good they are. Sometimes I marvel a bit, almost as though they were done by someone else. And in a way, they were done by someone else, a young artist, unafraid of hard work, obsessed really, end quote. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> that was great, some really wonderful <laughs> insight into Wrightson's work on Frankenstein. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, it's interesting, though, that he that quote that you closed with that, that they were done by someone else. Um, you know, as as a fan of Wrightson's art for many many years, I I think um, if you look at the, the full span of his career, it's possible to see sort of demarcations in it where his style mm -hmm. did change specifically, and Frankenstein seems to be the biggest one mm -hmm. because his work after that. And he started to go, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but he started to go more back into mainstream comics for a while after that. And it has a very different flavor. Would, have, have you seen that in his in his art? Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I did feel that um, I, I felt like he was under a lot more pressure, you know, because as we know, mm -hmm. artists have a very strict timeline. The writers have their, their amount of time. The artists get a, an amount of time. And then onto the letterer and colors and, and things like that. And I do feel that uh, the Frankenstein illustrations, because they were done on his time and when he, he had the time to really focus in, I do think that the, the level of effort and uh, work that he did, there's a reason why he's a master artist and why that is, is the illustrations for that are always pointed to as being his seminal work over his career. Um, you see even later work. Um, unfortunately, he, he uh, did develop a brain cancer. Um, and you can see like in his last uh, series with uh, Steve Niles, when they worked on Frankenstein Alive Alive, he wasn't actually able to finish it. He did the first three issues. And you can tell he, he was struggling. Um, it was hard. But but obviously he loved the, the subject matter. Otherwise, I'm not sure that he would have continued that long, but he, he worked as long as he could. Um, but yes, I would agree, James. I do think that it, it did change. And I, I think a lot of that's related to the fact that he was working under timelines. He had, you know, you know, had to pay the bills and the groceries and the whatnot. So um, yeah, you know, when, yeah, when you have all that time, it is a, the level of effort is a lot different. 
Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I didn't realize until hearing you say it that he didn't have a publisher for the illustrated Frankenstein when he started work on it. And so I think that's probably a big difference is he was doing that because he wanted to. Yeah. And, and uh, it was early in his career. Um, yeah. He started working on these illustrations and probably the, let's see, I think it was like early to mid 70s. And then I think he finished like right into 80, 81. And so, you know, he he was working on a lot of other stuff. Mm -hmm. So for him to work on, you know, illustrations and I'll, I'll just share one because I'm sure this audience is well aware of his art. But in case you're not, this is just one of mm -hmm. the pieces. This is the monster, uh, his one uh, portrait that he did. But you can see all the level of detail that he did and the fact that that just really shows how passionate he was about the project. Um, and he he went many, like probably 15 years trying to figure out how could he work with the Frankenstein story? How could he tell it in a visual in a visual way? Yeah. And in the end, you know, even though there were other uh, efforts out there, other comics that came out, I think the um, Classics Illustrated had uh, Frankenstein back in like the 40s. Um, and then I think it came out again in like 50s with a different cover. Um, but he wasn't he wasn't satisfied and he wanted to do it right. And by the time, you know, he's he'd read the the novel several times, really got a feel for it, really understood the spirit and the the story. Um, and of course, what I'm not able to tell here, because my uh, paper is probably about a 25 or 30 minute uh, <laughs> um, a story. Um, you know, he was also impacted by cinema. He grew up with cinema, yeah. grew up with comics, you know, reading at his local five and dime, you know, uh, in the window, reading the stories, you know, because he couldn't afford all the comics that he that he was able to read. But yeah. Yeah. And I think he had had dabbled with sort of what became Frankenstein earlier in his comics career. You mentioned the Muck Monster mm -hmm. and, uh, in the Swamp Thing series that he co-created with Len Wein. They had the Patchwork Man uh, was a character, very Frankenstein like character, Frankenstein's monster like character, I should say, uh, that he co-created. So it, it seemed like that was the project that pr probably was nearest and dearest to his heart of everything. Yeah. Um, and we do have some questions, so I'm going to jump in and we'll take one from Brian Matthews. Uh, when you write a nonfiction piece, do you try to summarize the writer's intent slash viewpoint, try to introduce a new approach to the writing or both? Hmm. That's a great question. Thank you, Brian, yeah. for putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess in this case, it would apply to the artist's intent as well as uh, a writer's intent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really try to leave myself out of it. It's, but it was really hard with Bernie Wrightson. Um, but as an academic writer, you do try to keep yourself out of it. Um, you do try to be um, objective with your research. Uh, you do try to uh, create an argument uh, that you're then going to discuss through that paper. So you do have your thesis. You do have kind of an argument that you that you want to put forward. Um, for me. Um, uh, my, I guess probably my argument, uh, in this particular paper was that, you know, this was a seminal work for, for Wrightson and, um, he's considered a master, but, um, I wanted to put him, I argued that he should be on a legendary, you know, status with, you know, like, uh, some of the other early, uh, artists of the time from EC Comics and, and mm -hmm. before, um, like Al Feinstein and, uh, or Feldstein and many others of that era, that he really did grow through the years, particularly, you know, he had over a 40 year uh, career. Um, so he he's earned a spot. I agree. Yeah, I would say that's for sure. Um, and one, one interesting thing that um, I, I mean, and I'll, I'll try. I'll try not to go too. And I'm a big Wrightson fan, so I could probably <laughs> talk about Bernie Wrightson's work for 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 hours. But I do recall, and I don't know if I still have this, but there was an issue of Fangoria, where they published some of the sketches and uh, production designs that he did for a planned adaptation of The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Mm. Um, 
which was another dabbling in classic horror that he undertook and brought a really unique uh, vision to. So he would uh, he would have been uh, perfect doing that. I think. Uh, too bad that ever did not come to fruition. Yeah. But we have uh, creep show. <laughs> we do. That is lovely. I think I, I, that I know I have. I think I have like three copies of that. So. <laughs> they reprinted it a few years ago. Um, but we also have a question from Nicholas. Um, rights and aside, what are other horror comic authors, artists, or titles you'd recommend folks check out maybe as a gateway into the medium? And, and I'm going to add to that since we're talking about Frankenstein, which is an illustrated novel. What would the what would the right be the rights and comic you'd suggest people go to to start? Mm, you know, um, I would say if you're really interested in Frankenstein and you really want to get into Bernie, I would say go back and take a look at the Muck Monster because that really is kind of his first foray. Um, but it it really culminates both his his writing because i mean he was a writer too he just wasn't as comfortable with that um but i would say go to the muck monster um i unfortunately don't remember uh what that's in i know it's in a creepy book on bernie wrightson so that would be a great entrance if you want to look at bernie wrightson um as far as other horror comic authors definitely i have to say steve niles Bernie Wrights and, and Steve Niles partner together. And, all, and um, for me, it was actually Steve Niles that uh, brought me into Bernie Wrightson's art when they did uh, Frankenstein Alive Alive. Well, they did, an, they did Frankenstein Alive Alive and then um, Bernie did a, a sequel. Uh, so it was the original uh, version that they worked on together. It's kind of the original sequel to Frankenstein. Um, that really brought me into... Um, Bernie Wrightson, but I would say Steve Niles, he did 30 Days of Night, he's done Criminal Macabre, he's done so many different series that I would say definitely check him out. Our own Jonathan Mayberry is a great person uh, to check out. He's also, you know, has crossed mediums, um, but he has V Wars. Um, he's also got Rotten Ruin, um, Joe Ledger. Of course, you know, those are, are novels too, but stuff does get adapted over to comics. Um, as far as artists, I would say always uh, one of my absolute favorite is um, Ben Temple Smith. He's an Australian uh, artist. He actually worked with um, Steve Niles. You're gonna gonna kind of make a connection there where I kind of got going. Um, it's all, all down to Steve. But, um, and then I would like to just toot uh, James Horn that uh, your Kojak series is also a great entrance into horror comics as well. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> your, check, your check is in the mail. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm going to close just with one more quick comment because I agree. Uh, but Sarah Tantley, you're so, <laughs> hair is so awesome. So, so uh, very nice on, on the purple hair. Oh, thank um, you. But thank you again for sharing that with us and talking about Bernie Wrightson. And we'll be uh, having you back on at the end with everybody to talk about what you might have coming up next. Thank you. All right. I am happy to introduce our next reader, Stephen Van Patten. Stephen is a Brooklyn-based horror writer who has won literary awards for horror, poetry, comedy, and publishing. Along with the Brookwater's Cursed Vampire Trilogy, a too soon... a too, uh, a, oh, a two-part, soon-to-be three-part killer genius series and the Raise Some Hell anthology series he's written with fellow HWA members Mark Abbott and Kirk Johnson. SVP has landed his dark works in numerous other anthologies, including Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, the Bram Stoker-nominated Under Twin Suns, and the much-anticipated Even in the Grave, which dropped in mid-2022. He has also written several compelling Black History episodes for the Extra Credit YouTube channel, his bandmates skit for Viral Vignettes, which starred TV legends Max Gale and John Schneider, won Best Comedy Skit in the First Monthly Film Festival, and earned a special mention in the original screenplay category. When he's not scaring or amusing people, SVP stage manages many a TV show, working for every major TV network one might think of. 
He produces the Beef, Wine, and Shenanigans podcast and co-hosts with his Hellraising pals, Mark Abbott, Kirk Johnson, and Denise Tapscott. You can find him by his full name on Facebook or on Twitter as at SVP Thinks, and also on Instagram at the, by the same handle. And of course, his website, laughingblackvampire.com. Join me in welcoming Stephen Van Patten. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's so great to be back. Um, I, I really do love doing this. Uh, so real quick, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, there's a little bit of a setup to this story, and I always try to do something that uh, I haven't done anywhere else when I do Galactic Terrors. So the setup is basically uh, a young man who uh, helps a woman in distress. You know, she has a bunch of groceries, so he helps her into her apartment, only to end up uh, only ended up drugged, tied to a couch, and now having a conversation with a sentient, sentient rather, uh, Chihuahua. Uh, so the name of the piece is Zodiac Chihuahua. It'll make sense in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> I tried to warn you. I wasn't barking at you because I like your Jordans. I was trying to get you to leave. When I heard Isabel offer you the water, I came out of the bedroom to stop you. I probably would have, but I know she picked me up and threw me in the closet and then poured me a glass of water, which was filled with drugs. And now here I am, wrists and ankles zip tied, laying on a musty couch, talking to a chihuahua. Dude, you're about to die and they'll kill me too if they figure out who I am. Figure out what? Who are you? The chihuahua sighed. You know about the astrological signs, right? Rodney shook his head. Sure, but what does that have to do with, and you know what an avatar is, yes? You mean like the movie? The chihuahua grunted in frustration. Fucking kids. No, dummy. Not like some damn science fiction movie. Avatar as in a physical manifestation of a deity on Earth. As in a divine incarnation. So what, you're an angel? No, I'm Aries. It took Rodney a few seconds, but he finally said, you are the actual Aries, as in you are what the Zodiac sign is based on? Give the kid a go, Star. But what does that have to do with me? Shh, not so loud, dummy, you'll blow my cover. Rodney, despite his predicament, managed to turn humble in the face of being chastised by a talking dog. The question still stands, why am I tied up here? Well, here's the bad news. Because you stuck around and drank the water, you could end up being an avatar. It took some struggling, but Rodney managed to reposition himself until he was finally sitting up. What? What I'm trying to tell you is the other two Zodiac deities that live in this apartment are dying. The nice Spanish lady you met is possessed by Libra. Ironically, she has Graves' disease and is not long for this world. Cancer's avatar mostly hangs in the bathtub, and you'll understand why when you see her. I think Libra tried to take you after she drugged you, but she couldn't get inside. Which reminds me, I gotta ask. What zodiac sign are were you bo born under? Capricorn. Aries' eyes widened. Ah, oh, damn. What? That explains why Libra couldn't transfer into you. She's an air sign. But Cancer, on the other hand, is your exact opposite. Maybe compatible, maybe not. Either way, I think that's what they're arguing about in the bathroom. Wait, they want to take over my body? Well, yeah, that is kind of the size of it, Aries answered. Sorry, kid. What the hell do you mean, sorry, kid? Aren't you one of them? You can't help me? The chihuahua almost seemed to smirk. Kid, they don't even know it's me. And I'm in a chihuahua. Trust me, this is not exactly my shining moment. 
I think Scorpio might have had something to do with why I'm like this. She's the one that led this walkout. Scorpio is the one in control? That might be the only thing in your story that makes any sense. Yeah, she's gotten a head start, probably on her third person by now. So you guys are possessing people based on compatibility? That doesn't explain how you ended up in a chihuahua, in a dog, and Libra in a person. Look, once you let go of your constellation, you fall. It's a long way down. And let me tell you, some of us just jump into the first semi-sentient being we can because we're scared. Giving up your constellation to come down here and get into the thick of it, that's a commitment. Rodney shook his head with wild disbelief. Wait, so you MFs can possess people like demons? We are celestials like all the other divine beings found in various mythologies. To explain it best is to say we're sort of gods of personality. Should I pray to Capricorn to get me out of this? Couldn't hurt, but I don't think he'd listen. The Chihuahua nodded. Why not? Because, Mr. I'm going to drink water from a strange woman, you got yourself into this. Capricorn's, eh, he's kind of a stickler for self-inflicted tragedies. So what do I do? Well, let's hope they try to transfer with cancer and that doesn't stick. No sooner had the Chihuahua's words been spoken than did Libra as Isabel return. In her hands, cradling its midsection, she held a king crab that was so large that its legs were dragging across Isabel's carpet. Rodney wasn't sure if Aries barked or said sensitive mf -er under his breath. You're awake! Libra cried. I guess you didn't put enough mick in my mickey, Libra. How did you know my real name? Libra's eyes glowed hot silver. The warmth and gratitude that had filled her face earlier as he carried her groceries was now replaced with the anger of a deity devoid of either patience or mercy. Her eyes sparked like arcing transformers as she kicked Rodney in his chest so hard that he bounced off the couch and onto the floor. The impact would send pain running up into his wrists as he fought to maintain his wits. Now on the floor, he brought his head up as high as he could, only to see the crab charging towards him, scrambling across the length of his body and making its way under his untucked shirt. While he could not see what was happening, he could tell from the excruciating pinches he suddenly felt that the crab had taken hold of his nipples with its pincers. Yes, Cancer, see if you can take him. Otherwise, we have to kill him, Libra cheered. Rodney screamed as everything turned white. And the, and the aches coming from his wrist and chest faded away. For a time, he was absently floating in a vacuum. Then, scared and confused, he watched as the blinding white suddenly turned black. The sense that he'd been gently carried on clouds ended in suddenly, replaced by the feeling that he was falling from an enormous height. His screams continued even as the plummeting ended with him coming to us rest, coming to rest on a cold but soft surface. Shut up, an angry voice with deep resonance shouted at him. Disoriented, he shook his head violently and tried to stand. Just sit there for a second, the voice, said, the voice continued. I'm sure you're dizzy. He did as he was told. When his eyes were finally able to focus, he could see who was talking to him. The being appeared to be at least 12 feet in height, but the mermaid tail curled at the end made it hard to be sure. From bottom to top, a scaly blue bottom transitioned into white and gray fur, a surprisingly muscular chest, and the face of a goat. Capricorn! Damn right, the Earth Sign King answered. You rescued me. Aerie said you wouldn't rescue me. Eh, that's why Captain Impatient ended in, up in a dog. He doesn't know everything, but he thinks he does. None of them do. All of them think they're so effing smart. But if you didn't rescue me, 
Cancer is still trying to transfer her essence into your body, but she can't because your life essence happens to be here with me. So, to be fair, I only sort of rescued you. No! Rodney looked around and realized that Capricorn was sitting on a throne in a room made of stars. You gotta stop her! Look, we don't have a lot of time for you to be short bussing it. The giant goat god leaned towards Rodney's face. The long and short of it is this. Everything Ares told you is true. Each of the entities that you know as signs of the Zodiac is a celestial. We're ask, we're, we are astrological deities, to give it a better explanation than the Chihuahua did. Jesus. No, not him. Capricorn sneered. We don't live in the same plane as your religious deities, which is why since the dawn of time, we were all under the impression that the extent of our powers was the influence over the personalities of humans born under us. The only connections we felt were when our names were taken in vain by those born under our specific signs. Of course, this mostly occurs when humans choose to blame us for personality traits that have led them to disappointment and ruin instead of holding themselves accountable for their stupid decisions. Like any other deity outside of the American Christian and Muslim faiths, we seldom get the credit when our influence leads to something good. I suppose something changed, which is why Aries, Libra, and Cancer are living together in an apartment. Now you're using that brain like a Capricorn, the fish-tailed goat laughed. Because if you're a celestial and thereby immortal, you can feed off the worship and you receive from humans. That's why, geographically speaking, certain gods who have been able to take to talk their flocks into monotheism have managed to transform themselves into super deities. Human worship is a form of nourishment and it can strengthen you unfathomably. As surreal as all this felt, Rodney was finally getting the picture. Is that why even though they're idiots, all these racists in America are getting away with things that seemingly bend the government to its will because they have a deity that is that they're empowering with their worship? Exactly, Capricorn laughed. They were some of the first to figure out that it's a good idea for the enslaver to trick or force the enslaved into worshiping their god instead of their own. What you end up with in that instance is millions of people all over the world, especially in your country, praying to a god that is helping other humans who despise them for their skin color or some other imagined infraction. Rodney nodded. That explains a lot. Now, there is more, there is more, there are more important things. Sorry. Now there is more to why America has slipped into backward slide, but that is something you can explore later. Because right now, you have more immediate problems. A sense of urgency leaped into Rodney's throat. Yes, we must go back and get that crab off me. Yes, and you'll need my help to do that. You're going to help me? Of course, Capricorn sounded less confident for the first time. But you are going to have to do something for me. It's, it'll be like going on a mission. Of course, I will be with you the entire way. But you need to understand that there will be some killing involved. What? Capricorn smiled at Rodney's reaction. For the most part, the 12 of us never put much thought into it because we never tried to have humans worship us before. We would just convey information based on who we are. Scorpios are known for being controlling because she is. Libras hate imbalance because she does. Taurans have shitty tempers and you can't tell them anything because that's his toxic trait. Even though cancer is trying to take over your body as we speak, they're super sensitive because she is. And the list goes on. Things went out of control one day. Scorpio gets a surge of power from some Wiccans who begin referring to her as the goddess Scorpio. She eventually gets her own cult and becomes so powerful that she realized that she could get up and leave her constellation. The others, being a bunch of copycats, provoked a Mercury retrograde that they used to create just enough of an energy build to spring themselves from their own constellations. Is that why the world has become so unstable? Capricorn nodded his head, which 
leaves me really surprised at Libra, who should by sheer nature be opposed to all of this. But why are some of them in animals? I must say that this is the part that surprised me too. But as it turns out, depending on an astrological deity's makeup, they may or may not be able to control where they land. And some of us seem prone to start off in our animal representation on Earth. Scorpio originally landed in a scorpion in Australia and has since made the transfer and is headed to her cult, where she will most likely take over and somehow end the world. She's priority number one, and she's got to be stopped. But everyone else has got to go too. All 11 of them must be found and physically destroyed so they can return to their constellations. Otherwise, they're just going to wreak havoc on Earth by possessing people and creating their own cults of worship. Think Greek mythology, just more obnoxious. The chaos visited on your world would be catastrophic. And I'll stop right there. Whew. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, that's a little nutty. I I'm just I have to share one comment because this just gave me a chuckle and I I could kind of go along. Whoop, where where to go? From Nick. He just closed his eyes and pictured a chihuahua talking with your voice. <laughs> so, uh, but we do, we have a quiet, Carol, I think you're muted just to give you a quick heads up. We can't hear you. Um, but I think, you know, this is the question that Teal posted kind of is probably on all of our minds. Mm -hmm. um, what the hell are you on? I.e., what inspired this story? <laughs> And I'm kind of curious, where did you, where did this come from? Because this is one, it's, it's kind of a different direction for you as a writer mm -hmm. and it's, it's great. And it's a really um, innovative kind of way to, to do some of the things that you're doing. So what, what was the, uh, the genesis of this? Well, I think because I research so many different things and I'm always in like these little stores where it's like, uh, the candles and the sage and all of these other things. And there's all this stuff online about, um, you know, different Zodiac signs and things like that. Like it kind of occurred to me, like you could actually kind of personify them and then just kind of, um, I guess maybe in a, in, in a kind of like a, like superhero avatar sort of setting, you can kind of just pit them all against each other and, and, and just have a little fun with that. Cool. Yeah. Wow. So like rock'em sock'em uh, uh, astrology robots. Yeah. Basically. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get messy. I can tell. I oh, can it, tell. It, it gets very messy. And, um, you know, and, and I, I, it, as I put at the very beginning of the story, there's a little disclaimer that, that, that basically spells out, I am not trying to disrespect anybody's Zodiac sign. So, you know, I, I love everybody. So don't uh -huh. come for me in the DMs uh -huh. with the, and I don't appreciate you saying that about blah, 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 you know, because I, well, I that, feel like. That, yeah. that actually leads into one of the things I was going to ask is, are, mm -hmm. are you actually involved in Zodiac stuff or was this just a, a rabbit hole you fell down? I mean, you, you said it was, you, it was, you it was a rabbit places. hole. It was a rabbit hole. So I fell down. It. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I, I think I, there was a point where I did. And then I remember one day it just kind of occurred to me that there is some BS to it, uh, you know, obviously, because it, it's like, you you know how sometimes you're reading your own um, horoscope and you see something like, oh, well, today uh, 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 Aries is going to ruin your day. It's like, well, why not in Aries's horoscope does it say, hey, Aries, stop being a dick? You know, <laughs> don't don't so ruin SPP's day. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Watch exactly. out for the Chihuahua. Yeah. 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 So, well, come uh, on. They're not fortune cookies. They're horoscopes. This is like, you know, the stars controlling our destiny. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> I, 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 I want a little more accuracy. So I, it's something that I've always kind of played around with, you know, um, right. just kind of like kept an eye on. And then this idea just hit me. So, uh, yeah. It, and uh, all I can say about the end is uh, it things really do not work out well for Rodney. Hmm. Hmm. So now this hmm. is this this is the start of a longer piece or an excerpt from a longer piece. Yes. Yes. How yes. long is the is the full piece? Is it is it a, a novella? Uh, is it a is a book book length? 
Uh, no, 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 no. I don't think. Oh. I, I mean, novella probably. As I, oh. as I continue to flush it out and 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 piss off, you know, other cancers and and, and such. Great. So we, have a, we have a question uh, from Brian about your story, yeah. Suani, in Under Twin Suns. Oh. So powerful. Can you talk about the writing of that story? Um. Well, I, well, of course, the genesis of that was uh, you, James, asking for it, Um. to which end uh, I, I kind of because I had looked at it years ago and it wasn't really fresh in my mind. So I had to mm -hmm. kind of reread it and, uh, um, you know, uh, the Robert Chambers pieces. And uh, I basically, it, you know, I, I found the one thing that was kind of pertinent to African-Americans. And then I just said, all right, well, let's see, how do I play? Because it's such a, like a, a, like a toss off line, yeah. you know, the whole thing about, you know, Sony and, and whatever, um, that I decided to just kind of expand on that. Yeah, it's just I think it's in, in the repair of reputations by Robert Chambers. There's mm -hmm. just one one mention of it as, as a region that it was created um in his version of the the uh the United States at that time. And he was writing in 1895, projecting to 1921 and had all of these weird political things. And I was glad that you picked up on that because it, it is one of those things that's really tantalizing within the context of that story. What what does that look like, that place? What does that society look like? And uh, I thought you did a, a fantastic job kind of flushing that out and creating some place just as sinister as the rest of the uh, the things in that world. Thank you. And and I always have to say, this is the story that always makes me cry at the end. So yeah. gosh darn you, SVP. <laughs> I'm sorry, Carol. <laughs> sorry, not sorry, he says. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, well, you know, we <laughs> also, as to. writers, we like to get a visceral reaction from readers. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, when That's you can true. pull that off, you know, even if, even if the person's feelings are, you know, out of whack, you do kind of go home and you're like, yeah, nice work there. Yeah. <laughs> so that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, no, that's cool. It's a very intense story. You you very frequently take a particular avenue in to look at the, your writing, and uh, you know it's much appreciated and very well done. So, thank right. you. So, and on a, on a non writing related question, what are your your Halloween plans this year? Are you do you have a costume lined up? I know you've had some spectacular Halloween <laughs> costumes. Um, you know, this one's kind of feeling like uh, just kind of pop the fangs in, get a nice suit on and, you know, go someplace and, you know, and kind of let every let other people entertain me for once. I think that's kind of what I'm leaning towards right now. Um, I don't know. I might do like uh, like a karaoke thing. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I'm see. I'll see how I'm feeling. Yeah. Nice. One one of the most am amazing costumes I ever saw was back in college. One guy put on just one of those sort of clear plastic masks that didn't really, you couldn't really tell from a distance that the person was wearing a mask, but you couldn't tell who it was. Mm -hmm. And it was creepy. It was really creepy. You know, it's like, wow, who, that, who, what? Who are you? What are right. you? No. Yeah. Yeah. It was cool. It was cool. Yeah. Sometimes the best costume is like the, you know, oh. off the cup improvisation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that's true although i i you you still have one of the absolute best dr strange costumes i've ever seen <laughs> oh yes thank you yeah thank i thought i know teal used to to play dr strange teal james glenn who i think mm -hmm. is in the audience tonight i'd love to see the two of you like you know <laughs> reenact re the multiverse of madness uh, <laughs> uh that okay. would be hilarious that yeah. well if, he, if that he's down nice. i am i mean you know right what the hell <laughs> That would be great. That would All be right. great. Oh, well, cool. We're, we're well, getting near uh, the end of our time. Maybe we should invite the uh, the our, our other readers back on tonight to talk yeah. about what yeah. everyone has coming up next. I think that's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. It'd be terrific. So, awesome. Doo -doo -doo. Welcome back, Michelle and Mike. Hey. Mike, you're muted. Just uh, Oh, there we go. Yes, and I apologize. I was muted before because I had to unplug my microphone to get something to put under my computer so it didn't overheat. I'm in a strange Ooh. location, and I had it on a nice uh, little vinyl stool, and it was getting warmer and warmer. Hmm. So, 
the good news is it has not exploded yet. Good. Mm. That would be a, that would be a first for galactic terrors. Carol's laptop. Exploding. <laughs> well, it was just such wonderful literature. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. It's like mind blown laptop blown. Yeah. Oh, well. So um, it, it, we've heard some really fun stories and interesting words from, from all of you folks, but we're kind of interested in hearing what you have coming up next. Yeah. Mike, what's, what's coming up next for you? Um, well, you guys uh, brought up the uh, Exploring Dark short fiction series. Uh, the next one's coming out probably in the next three months or so on uh, Gemma Files. Oh. So... Um, that's what I'm working on right now. It should be out soon. Ooh, cool. uh, and all sorts of little things. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. How about you, Michelle? Um, I'll be working on some essays um, related to In Cantu, The Living Mummy, um, mm -hmm. cat and kind of Egyptian cat mythology uh, from The Mummy, uh, the 1999 film with Brendan mm -hmm. Fraser. And then I'm working on a paper uh with regards to mummy and the vengeful dead and so i'll be taking a look at mummies in film starting with uh karloff's uh film from 1932 and kind of going through cinematic history and how different mummies have had a vengeful uh drive or you know effort to be nasty so um that's what i'm upcoming i'm also editing a collection on highlander so Highlander, the IP, not just the original film. Um, and that'll be a collection of uh, critical essays. And then I just continue to work on uh, HP Lovecast podcast with my co-host, uh, Nicholas Dyack. Excellent. Fantastic. Excellent. And you also mentioned something about playing cat games. Hmm. I do. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, on my, on my phone, I play some different cat games. <laughs> I, okay. I kind of have a few cats too, so. <laughs> well, kinda. writer, you know, it's yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Mike, yeah. do you have a cat? Yeah, I thought she would make an on-screen appearance, but she's dodging okay. the camera. Uh, okay. Yeah, cool. yeah. And I know the Laughing Black Vampire has a black cat, so. Yes, yeah, yeah. she's around here someplace, but she's yes. you know subdued at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. All these words tricked her out. She was afraid of the Chihuahua. Yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> What's coming up for you, SVP? Like tomorrow? Uh, well, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, uh, in a few hours, I'll be hopping on a plane going down to Atlanta. The multiverse. Uh, Mark Abbott and Kirk Johnson are already warming up the bar stools. Uh, I have, I'm still in post production for. Uh, little something called Dead Man Country that mm -hmm. we shot uh, with the help of a couple of people that are actually uh, in this chat room, Teal James Glenn and specifically, and the basic premise. So it's a short film and basically the idea is it's a zombie who uh, is auditioning for a country music uh, singing show. Oh. Uh, when we shot it, I played the zombie. Um, Teal was one of the judges uh, along with Denise Tapscott and uh, out back, um, and that wasn't me. Um, I don't think. Um, sure what that was. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, I've got that going on, and a and a few, and of course, I'm trying to finish different stories and novels and all yeah. kinds of other things, and eventually, um, the whole of Zodiac Chihuahua will be uh, end up somewhere, and mm. uh, you know. That it, it'll make sense in its you know full form, mm -hmm. cool. and uh, yeah, that, that's cool. basically it. And I believe your your short film came from a story that you read to us at Summer Dark uh, at uh, yes. uh, at the Oasis Readings, right? Yeah, read yes, read and actually and sang and yeah. sang. Yeah, yeah. I, I, he brought I his sang. own guitarist. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and actually now there's a there's a new version of the song uh, on iTunes. Hmm. <laughs> has that, yeah, has like that a whole, precursor whole to the song moment. been released yet? I know there was a clip yeah. that you can listen to. Okay, great. No, no, the whole song is released. Awesome. Cool. Oh, cool. No, that's yeah. pretty neat. Yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's, a, neat. it's a different arrangement. It's a lot more um, earthy, bluesy 
uh, but it was a lot of fun. It was a, a shout out to uh, Carl Schwartz, who was the guitarist on this version. Nice. Um, really, really, uh, really kind of happy with how that turned out. Oh, can't wait to see the whole thing. That'll be fun. Yeah. So I'm doing all kinds of stuff now. <laughs> That's great. Mm, that's cool. Well, speaking of all kinds of stuff, we have a lot of things to offer for folks who uh, are on our mailing list. And uh, thank you to all of our authors for being so generous with uh, sharing stuff. If you're on our newsletter, uh, we're going to pull some names at random on Sunday night at midnight. And we have uh, SVP has offered uh, an EPUB of Brookwater's Curse. And I mentioned already that Michael has offered uh, two signed copies of, of books. So thank you for those. And Michelle has offered something really cool, which is a, a handmade Halloween, you know, six by six inch journal with your choice of two different color uh, uh, illustration paper, you know, design kind of things. So that's pretty neat. So thank you, everybody. And of course, the physical ones should go just uh, there's one of them. Yep. This is there's one pattern. Focus. Yeah, it's one style of things, very Halloweeny, creepy, and the other one is, yeah, retro modern. Yes. Yeah, yeah, a little softer, and neat. Yeah, so thanks. Uh, those look like a lot of fun. Um, so the physical ones, we'll, we'll we'll have those just sent out to folks in the U.S. And if uh, you're not in the U.S. and your name gets drawn, uh, you're more like more than likely going to be getting a wonderful ebook. So that's terrific. Yes. So thank you. If you haven't signed up for a newsletter yet, please do and tell your friends all about it because I'm sure they might like to be involved with this as well. And thank you to our authors for offering wonderful, cool stuff. Yeah. So yeah. Jim, what about, what about you? What do you have coming up? Uh, what do I have coming up on October 31st in honor of Halloween? East Beck books will be releasing uh, the eyes of the dead, the final installment in my corpse fauna cycle of novellas and short stories mm -hmm. uh, so it's essentially uh you know the, the finale of a zombie armageddon taking place exactly where you would expect it to a uh, desolated amusement park mm -hmm. <laughs> yes yes i'm pretty excited because i i backed the thing and i got a hard cover with all four of yours in it so that's really neat yeah nice. yeah 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 so that was cool when that arrived yeah neat and carol how about you well, tomorrow, I'm actually in North Carolina right now, which is why I'm sitting in the corner in a hotel room. I'm driving down to Multiverse, uh, uh, having been waylaid on a plane on the way home from Stoker. I'm a little reluctant to get on a plane again for a while. Um, so I'm looking forward to Multiverse Convention this weekend. And uh, one of the things that we'll be talking about, a whole bunch of our authors who were contributors in A Woman on Becoming are going to be down there, including nice. Stephen Van Patten and uh, also Teal James Glenn, who's in the in the audience and uh, a bunch of our uh, Teal is in the book and uh, we have Mark Abbott will be down there and also Nicole Givens Kurtz and I'm bound to forget somebody who's going to be there. Uh, Rachel Brune, my co-editor will be down at Multiverse as well. So we're going to do a little thing on Sunday morning with a little launch thing. So that'll be fun. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Excellent. Yeah. We'll have yeah. a great time. Uh, and for uh, those oh, and I have oh, a couple other fun things coming up. Um, Shade Bar the, usually does mm -hmm. a noir at the bar, and they're doing horror at the bar. So uh, <laughs> a few of us will be reading on October 23rd there at 6 o'clock at night. And the, um, the Friday before Halloween, the Paramus Barnes & Noble is hosting a number of us from the HWA New York chapter to come and do um, a reading of local authors. So that's going to be a lot of fun, too. Uh, in, including uh, Jim and SVP will be there as well. So, and Teal and uh, Mark and Chris Ryan and uh, Damon Manx and a bunch of people, a bunch of people. Yeah, it'll be fun. Should be, should be a good time. Yeah, cool. All right. So what, uh, let me just ask everybody one, one quick question. What, what's your favorite thing about Halloween, Mike? <laughs> uh, um, hmm. I guess just all the crazy costumes. I like I like the bad costumes, where some somebody earlier said, you know, the improvised costume is the best. I can't remember who said that among you, but uh, oh, okay, yeah, so, yeah. right on the nose. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, I love the bad costumes. Those are the scary ones, aren't they? The ones that. You know, somebody isn't totally in control of and floppy. <laughs> like the mask is just a little bit off. You know what I mean? It Ooh, makes it yeah. all the so. mm -hmm. 
That's yeah, what I. Yeah. That's my plan for Halloween is to see. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Michelle, what's your favorite part of a uh, thing about Halloween? Uh, watching movies, but also looking at all the decorations on the houses. Mm. It's kind of like heralds in the season of a lot of houses being colorful and lit up and it's festive. So and yeah. I, I live in Phoenix, so, you know, we don't get snow here and things like that. So we'll take mm -hmm. decorations where we can get them and have that nice festive spirit. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. SVP, what about you? Favorite thing? Um, I, I, I would go with the movies, but also just from the nostalgia aspect of it. Um, it's always interesting to see something that scared the hell out of you as a kid, but now as a grown man, it either still scares the hell out of you, or <laughs> you're like, I was scared of this, you know, it, it, it's right. just running through the paces with that. It can be a lot of fun. And since Th these things are all on now all the marathons and everything you know it's a good time to just kind of catch up to that yeah 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 well nicholas dyack said gummy worms coming out of chocolate brownies and i'm like e okay fine fine that works that <laughs> yeah works. that works jim what about you what's your favorite halloween thing i think i think my favorite part at this point um used to, it used to be going trick-or-treating with my kids but they've kind of outgrown that so now it's it's getting trick-or-treaters at the house uh we're, yeah. for some some reason we're just on the block that like is the trick-or-treat block in the neighborhood oh. and so from about three in the afternoon to eight at night it's a steady stream and it's just fun to watch see the kids in their costumes and uh see everybody going by but um i i kind of agree with mike and steven too about you know the improvised costume and this this one wasn't particularly scary but my favorite halloween costume that i ever put together was uh, one year i got a fedora a pair of black sunglasses and a couple of rolls of toilet paper and turned myself into the invisible man <laughs> <laughs> i hope it wasn't raining <laughs> oh wow yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's okay. There's an image. We've got to see pictures of that some other time. Uh, yeah. I'm sure they are somewhere. They're probably quite out of focus, though. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. So, that's how about funny. you, Carol? Uh, I have one favorite memory. When I was in fourth or fifth grade, my mom and I were home because my dad was on a business trip. It was Halloween evening. People kept coming to the door, circuit reading. We were watching Hound of the Baskervilles oh. on the black and white TV in the kitchen. You know, the, the TV that's like about this big. And mm. everybody's like, the doorbell rang again. Do you want to get it? I don't want, I want to watch that. You get it. No. <laughs> so we were having so much fun of the movie. We didn't even want the trick or treater. So that was very fun. That was very fun. Oh, well. Well, let's just say real quick, uh, coming up next month, November 10th, uh, we have our three readers, Kenneth Kane, Karen Hewler, and Nicholas Dyack. So yeah. mark your calendars, please. I'm looking forward to that. So uh, this has been very cool. It's been really fun. We had three wildly different things tonight, which I think is really fun and interesting. So thank you to, to our three guests. We appreciate your time and your talent. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much for sharing your wonderful readings and taking some questions and, and having a great chat with us. Very much appreciated. Well, thank you uh, guys, please. Thank you guys. Cool. Yeah. And, uh, Very good. Thank you to all those in the audience who've been following us and watching tonight. Um, if you haven't already, please click to subscribe to, to get updates on future galactic terrors transmissions or just hit like on the, uh, on the, the little thumbs up button there under your screen uh, or on Facebook. Uh, and yeah. uh, we, we appreciate that. Um, and hopefully we'll see you back here in November. Sounds so, great. Until then, everyone have a, a great rest of October, a fantastic Halloween and, and all that good, uh, good sugary stuff. <laughs> good spooky stuff. Yeah. And may, may gummy worms always come out of your brownies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.